Yeah. Are, are you ready then? You... Well, I'm ready when any. Well, I'm as ready yeah. as I will be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, if you share your screen now. Right, back again. Right. Okay, Stuart, I've got, I've got it now. Hang on, share screen. Hey! hey. hey. Can you see, can you hey. see a picture? Yeah. Oh, can you see it now? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Okay. Right then. Make a start. Well, it's a compilation. You can, you can see me. You can hear the. You can see the picture, can't you? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Joy Park. Right, well, this is a compilation of a few of my photos over the years, and they've all these have all been taken on my digital camera anyway. Um, this is taken at uh, Victoria Park at Newbury on a very, very cold day. But I turned it upside down and got that result, which is much better. And um, it's a bit weird. You look so you're looking out from under the water, out of the pond. Anyway, this was my. Um, this is my first SLR, an East German practica. Um, bought it in the early 1980s, fully manual, ideal to learn photography on. And also it had what we call split image focusing. And I don't know whether they have that now on cameras. I'll explain to you what I mean on this diagram. Split image meant that um, you focused on the verticals. If the verticals split, the photograph was out of focus. If they were complete, they were in focus, and it was a brilliant manual focusing system. Anyway, the next um, the next uh, camera was an Olympus LM2N, early 1990s, lovely camera. And um, I bought two of these secondhand. They lasted me 15 years. And in the 1990s, I did a couple of photographic courses to learn photography, city and guilds, and then. I moved in 2007 to Fuji. I knew nothing about digital cameras. I knew nothing about sensors. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Great, great. Anyway, I knew nothing about sensors or digital cameras. And it was a bit of a learning curve. But this, this camera did quite well, really. I still got it. And I brought it up. I can hear some hissing in the background. Uh, what I need to do is do everything. Oh. everybody. Okay. Right, I've mute all. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Alan, unmute. Got it. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, you can hear me now, can you? Yeah. Right, right. Anyway, I knew nothing about um, digital cameras at all, nothing about sensors. And it was all push button and a bit of a learning curve. So I bought this bridge camera and it served me quite well. And then um, the next picture I'm going to show, I brought this camera out of retirement about two weeks ago and took the following picture. Oh, hang on. God. The button's on the side of the screen. Yeah. That's it, got it. Hmm. Which was a... My present camera, Nikon, the least expensive of the Nikon DLSRs, and it served me well actually. Um, it's now got 65,000 shutter actions on the camera, and two, two kit lenses later, um, it's doing okay. And, um, damn. right, as some of you know, um, my other hobbies, ships, maritime history and boats, and I belong to a society called the World Ship Society. Tens, tens of four. Bloody pictures gone again. Hang on. Can you see it now, okay? Yeah, yeah. Put on your Put on. Right, got it, got it. Um, hang on. Anyway, anyway um, I was at the time, I was this day in Southampton, um, Hive Marina, I was also looking for project vote photographs for reflections. This is a bit of a mundane picture, it doesn't do much, but I turned this one upside down. It looked quite good actually, upside down. But the next one, um, I entered for the project vote and the, the water was like glass, the sun was low, it was like the golden hour and it was a beautiful shot. This is inside the marina. You've all seen this picture, um, harbors and ports. I think it got second 
Um, it's a container ship being towed to the container berths. And I, took, I was about three quarters of a mile away when I took this picture with a 55 to 300 uh, lens. And on the Nikon DX cameras and lenses, um, in 35 mil terms, uh, a 55 lens would be, 55 to 300 would be 80 to 450 mil. And 450 mil is a big, big bonus for this, this sort of photography. And also wildlife and birds. Uh, Stuart and I went down to um, Southampton, March 2015, to see the um, latest P&O ship, the Britannia, arrive on her maiden arrival, and then normally salute the ship with uh, the tubs, salute the incoming ship with uh, water cannons and such like. And that's the actual ship. This one was taken from Hive, the Queen Mary II, and. Um, she, um, she was roughly, I guess, about a mile away. Now, I did a very slight crop on this, um, used the long lens. And some people don't realise that this ship is not a cruise ship. She's actually an ocean liner. She was built as an ocean liner, like the QE2, um, uh, to go also uh, designed to go cruising. If you're in a port or a harbour, if you can get on the water, you can see things from a different perspective. If there's a, a boat giving trips around the harbour, jump on it. It's an ideal opportunity. Um, this is Queen Mary II again, taken from the Hythe Ferry. I used a wide angle lens on this. The bow looks a bit elongated, but it's not too bad. Re remember the old QE2? She came out of service from Cunard in 2008. And I was working as a postman on National Green at the time. And... Um, one of my customers was a freelance photographer called Gordon Roberts, and um, he was doing work for Hampshire the County magazine, not Hampshire Life, Hampshire the County magazine, a similar magazine. And he said to me one day, he said, we haven't got any photographs of QE2 at Cow Shop. We're doing a, a, an article on the ship, sad, sad farewell to QE2. So I loaned him uh, three or four photographs taken at Cow Shop slides that is and one of the funnel this one i was really pleased and proud about this because i supplied him with this one and it's the very first photograph of mine that was published even if it was only a small picture in the magazine and um, this is taken with the, the old olympus film camera from the Hythe ferry another occasion i was in southampton on the ferry doing a return trip to photograph a royal caribbean ship Took some photographs on the way out, on the way back, this um, container ship was approaching mole performance. And I thought, oh dear, this has messed things up, but she turned out to be the star of the day. And um, she was a 50,000 tonne ship, medium to big in those days. This is about 17 years ago. She's still using the film camera. Anyway, you don't often get this close to a ship. We were on a pint-sized ferry, about 200 tonnes, looking up a 50,000 tonne ship. Well, remember the container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal lately was 200,000 tonnes. And I'll just mention something about the weather. I'm always a bit weary about salt water getting in my cameras. Um, even on a day like today, a day like this and a nice sunny day, you could get um, spray if it's windy, salt spray and such like. I'm always very careful. And on this day, the weather was changeable. It was like this one minute, and five minutes later, it was like this, a squall and rough water and high winds. So you can be a bit careful with um, uh, photographing uh, down at the coast. The other thing I do, or don't do, I don't use a tripod, I use a monopod, because I'm not, I don't want the hassle of somebody tripping over my mon uh, tripod. The other thing was, um, just a little something about uh, the dockside. This is Marco Polo. She's now been scrapped, unfortunately. Um, Bristol Docks. I was on overnight on spent overnight on the ship. It was a PR thing to encourage people to go on cruises. So when I left the ship, there was a policeman on the dock. Can I go along? I asked him permission to walk along the dock and take photographs of the ship. He said, no problem. People were busy. We don't allow it. And the reason I asked him is because since 2001, 9-11, 
the security on the docks have, has been stepped up big time. You're not in Southampton docks, you can't take, you're not allowed to take photographs in the docks and um, there's high security. But if you want to take interior shots of the ship, um, I was told by somebody, I know he's been on lots of cruises, get up early and walk around the interior of the ship when, when uh, everybody's still in bed. So I was up at 6.30. Basically, I basically had the public rooms to myself. Two hours later, it would be um, with people everywhere. Anyway, the photo club did a trip to Winchester a few years ago, and good it was, very good it was too. And in the afternoon, we were walking past this monument, um, and there's a busker, street busker, with this artificial skeleton electronically geared up to play the drums. And I rather like that photograph. The background's good, the foreground I like, it just works for me. Anyway, I've got to kick myself over this photograph. This is taken in Lyme Regis on holiday. And um, a few weeks later, I gave Steve Lewis some photographs for the mix and match. And what did the opposition come up with? I didn't, sorry, I didn't put this photograph into Steve. I wish I had. Um, the opposition came up with a photograph of RNLI Yellow Wellingtons. And this cow's got the Yellow Wellingtons. We could have had a good match. Anyway, I thought you might like to see some photographs of Bucklebury, Marsden, Horticultural Society in the summer show. Um, I think Stuart, uh, Colin, Paul, I think Chris, uh, Sue and myself have been along at times to judge their in-house photographic competition and um, when finished I used to go around taking photographs. This is a comp compilation, uh, little compilation uh, show from about three different shows. Um, what I do is um, I don't, I take photographs before the public arrive. Same reason I don't want anybody to trip over my tripod. The first time I took photographs, I used flash handheld and I had harsh shadows. So I used a tripod and um, a very uh, time exposure, slow shutter speed of about one or two seconds, a very small aperture to get the maximum depth of field. And it worked quite well. Oh, and the low ISO. Oh, and uh, don't forget the food, your very nice food. And it's not tea break yet. Anyway, uh, onto the vegetables. <clears throat> There's one little problem I found with the veg, um, with the tables, I should say. <clears throat> the, they'd lay paper out, um, rolls of white paper on the tables for, for, the, for a nice background. And little bits and pieces used to fall off the flowers and the vegetables onto the table. And when I was editing the photographs, I spent time cloning out the bits and pieces. I highlighted the cherries and the blackberries just to give them a bit of punch. Looks like something, something from Day of the Triffids. No rhubarb. Oh. You can see why I use the small, de uh, small aperture to try and get a good depth of field. But there's hardly any shadows. Just I just use natural daylight from the windows.
I haven't got the horizon wrong. It, it was meant to be at an angle. The flowers went off at an, off at an angle, so I angled the camera. And, and same with that one. But as soon as the public arrived, I stopped photographing. I didn't uh, take any more photographs. D-Day, 75th anniversary, drivers drive to remember 22nd of June, 2019. Um, a convoy of US Arm, ex US Second World, um, War Army vehicles did a uh, drive or uh, uh, drive from Portsmouth to Greenham Common, and they parked up at uh, top of the car park at top of um, Crookham Hill on the old, old Thornford Road, and then before proceeding to the college. I don't think that Land Rover would have been in the Second World War. They didn't produce them until about 1948. The Willys Jeep, there's quite a few Willys Jeeps there. At the end of the Second World War, the Jeep, the Willys Jeeps that um, the Yanks brought across, uh, they left a lot of them here and the farmers snapped them up. The Rover Car Company realized that the farmers would need a replacement. So the Land Rover was born. They had outriders on motorbikes um, for assistance on the convoy from Portsmouth. And this is the uh, turning at the top of Crookham Hill. They're on the way down to Thornford Road and up the 339 to uh, the college. This is at the college. I took about 10 photographs of this to try and get it right, because you know what flags are like to photograph in the wind. And um, they're all dressed in their army gear and there's an army, uh, 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 naval and also uh, forces there as well. Um, when I was at Royal Mail, I did stand in on long lane delivery and uh, about on the northern part and about um, half or three quarters, of a mile, three quarters of a mile before the red shoot turning on the right, we come back towards, the, towards Newbury. On the right hand side, there was a track that led up to a, a garage called Dallas Autos. And they also serviced all these old army vehicles. When you drove up there, it just looked like an army base, yeah, with all these vehicles around. And we went up further up the track. I used to deliver to uh, the ex-jockey, Joe Mercer. And at the end of the day, they had a ceremony um, at, the, at the college. This is good. Um, I was walking back from Tesco's one Sunday morning and had my compact with me. And this hot air balloon was um, actually uh, scraping across the tops of the trees. You could hear it. And it landed right in the middle of the moors, 200 yards from my house. And um, it was a Belgium crew. They'd um, set off west of Newbury in a, like a balloon fest. And it was about the third time they'd flown this balloon. And um, anyway, the support vehicle, the big four before with the trailer turned up minutes later. And it was unbelievable, unbelievable. Within about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, they had this balloon wrapped up with its, with its uh, basket in the back of the trailer and they were away. I'm not very good at photographing aeroplanes. This is at Forley Court, um, just down the river from Henley, um, the Mac Alpines place. They, um, the Mac Alpines run a, a, a steam rally or steam fair every, once every two years, and they organise uh, for a um, Spitfire and a Hurricane to fly across. I think the one in front is the Spitfire, and the one behind is the Hurricane. So I'm not very good at photographing aeroplanes in the sky. But 
put them on the ground and it's a different uh, story altogether. This is um, White Wartham, um, the retro show. And the good bit about the, the retro show is that um, at White Wartham, they've got the airfield so they can fly old aircraft and, you know, classic aircraft, which they can't do at the Newbury uh, showground because the, the retro sh shows move there now. But that's the aeroplane on the ground. It's a Second World War fighter plane. I don't know which one, but uh, so uh, I think while I'm learning to photograph aircraft in the air, I'll stick to the feathered variety. Um, you might have seen this picture before. I think it's on our Facebook page. Um, this was taken when we had one of our trips down to the Discovery Centre. And this is while we were setting up the uh, for a club evening at the football club. I was unloading the car by the side entrance. And um, I think the football club made the pets of these ducks. This one and his mate started posing. So I got the camera out of the car, sat on the brick parapet and started taking photographs for about 10 minutes. And that's his mate. And this one I was quite proud of. I was very proud to win the Chairman's Cup one year with this. Um, the project vote was movement. So I went down to the Discovery Centre. I couldn't photograph the birds. They're either too far away or flying in the wrong direction. So I thought, let's go to the canal at the wharf at Newbury. And the good thing about it is if birds are going to land in the water, they're going to land reasonably close to you. But it's still a waiting game. And the other bonus there, people come to feed the birds. So it attracts the birds. And you could say bird in hand, but that was one of our club evenings when a group of people brought some owls along for us to photograph. Uh, the story behind this one, um, this was taken in Salisbury. It was a big DIY tool outlet and their car, at the end of their car park, was a big wire fence with a box on the side of the fence for um, kids to put a coin in and make these dinosaurs and uh, uh, move the heads and uh, uh, necks and make a, make a noise. And anyway, I played around with this. This had taken from a compact. It took about seven or eight shots. And um, I played around with this in fast stone and then Photoshop, played attention to the teeth and turned it to that. And you probably recognise it. It's in the it's in, my, in this this year's photo book. <clears throat> this was Henley traditional boat show or rally that takes place about two weeks after the regatta, and um, there's plenty of stalls there with all sorts to sell. And I thought this looks an interesting photograph. They're interested in sub subject, so I took a photograph, and the lady stall holder came over to me. She said, "Oh." Why are you taking that photograph? I thought I don't need a model release form for an elf. Anyway, um, it transpired that um, somebody else earlier in the day had been taking a photograph of an ornate wooden box of hers with the idea of uh, producing the same thing, replicating the box. I said, oh no, I've just taken a photograph because it's just in interesting to take. And it's surprising what you can find at the um, Henley show. They even sell you an old American car. I had a dinky toy version of that one. And there's all brick or brac bits and pieces of old boats, and you name it, ladders, whatever, lights and that for sale. You build, build, build your own boat. And sail it, uh, steer it. Um, I'll say something about this one. This is the um, this is the Thames Slipper Launch. Um, they still build them on the Thames. Uh, this is one of Peter Freebody's boats on show. He's just up river from uh, Henley. These boats were very popular in the 1920s, 30s, and late 40s, and then after the Second World War, um, they um, you can still buy a new one have a new one built 
and uh, we'll have an old one repaired and rebuilt. And um, some, some of these are petrol driven, some of the newer ones are electric. But just to show you what the interior is like, very, very plush, and you have to have deep pockets. I think one of these could set you back in the region of 200,000 pound. And this was one of the old slippers, one of the old slipper launches, but this really was um, really an exercise in depth of field for me. Um, I used a kit lens, 1855 kit lens. I didn't dare put the camera on the deck of the boat. I just rested my arm against the boat um, for support, used a very small aperture and then took the shot. And just to show you what the interiors are like on these boat, old boats, wicker, wicker chairs and tables and that, bottle of champagne and the uh, glasses, except that's Buck's Fizz, just in case the bottle gets stolen. It's cheaper than champagne. And this is what the slippers look like on the water. The stern on the left hand side goes down to the deck, goes down to meet the water. Um, you can see in the background the marquees from the um, Henley Regatta, from Henley Church in the, in the background. Uh, the steamboats, all sorts of boats there, uh, but it's all wood and brass. Um, there's no, no fiberglass, so it's all wood and brass and no fantastic plastic, basically. There's all sorts of boats, um, the old wooden stuff, you know, wooden rowing boats, skiffs, motor boats from the 50s and 60s, and these steamboats. This is the most famous steamboat on the Thames, the Alaska. Um, she was built in about the 1880s for Salters. There's a passenger ship to travel between Teddington Lock and Oxford, five day trip, and the passengers would stay overnight in. Uh, riverside hotels or pubs. This is an in interesting old boat, um, Sabrina. She's actually built of iron and she was built for, um, built for uh, the canals, as, uh, for one of the canals in the Midlands as an um, inspection launch. And she was apparently used by the um, uh, directors for, um, as a pleasure yacht when not working. This boat is the only boat at the Attaboy, it's the only boat at the show that was actually served in the Battle of Jutland in 1916. She was a tender on one of the um, cruisers. And of course you've got the, um, the little ships, the Dunkirk little ships um, on parade there, they parade up and down. This boat, this picture could have been taken from the water. They were just sorting themselves out with how they're going to berth after doing the uh, trip up and down the water. This one's in my, uh, in the photo book this year. Um, this is a Reaver, an Italian Reaver um, speedboat. They still make them. They were building them like this in the 1950s. And the scene beyond the windscreen gives you an idea what it's like at Henley uh, boat show. You've got Gloriana, the Queen's row barge on the right. Um, they also had cars there as well. This is an amphibian car, amphibious car, I should say. Um, they were German. Germans built them in the 1960s. And um, I did read a, re read a review on these once. And they said they weren't very good on the water and they're not much better on the road. But the propellers are behind the rear wheels. There's two propellers. And also, um, in America, a good one of these can fetch, you know, auction can fetch about $90,000. It's really a, um, a play thing. It's not really a card you'd use normally. And this is what they're like in the water, to give you an idea. Um, as standard equipment, they have a bilge pump. And I wonder what's, I'm wondering what's wrong there because everybody sat on the tops of the seats. Oh. Um, you do get a few unusual exhibits. This Rover from about the, two, year, the early 2000s, two front ends fitted back to back. And the gentleman in the colorful waistcoat, the owner was telling me, he said, oh, it's street legal, street legal. He said, I drove it to the show. The right hand side of the car is the front and the rear and the left hand side is the rear with the rear passenger seats facing backwards. Very handy if you've got a backseat driver. And still, of course, they had the, um, the old uh, classic cars there as well, all sorts. 
We've seen that one before. And that's not me in the post office van either. That was taken at um, uh, the Newby Classic Car Show at um, the College. It's a possibility it might run this year because it is an outside event. This is at Hennick, the um, family fun day. I put this in because every car show I seem to go to, I tend to see the type of car that I learned to drive in or the type of vehicle I first owned. The van on the A35 van on the left, I owned, it was, uh, I owned one of those. It was my first set of four wheels. I owned it, had a, it was a gray, gray one. A few years ago, I was up in Norfolk, uh, Norfolk not far from Cromer. And um, the fishermen up there tend to use these old uh, caterpillar tractors to rusty old heaps to move their boats in and out of the water. As you see, all mod cons. Anyway, some old boy was on the beach and saw me photographing this uh, tractor. And he said, the fisherman will be, the old fisherman will be along in a minute to put his boat in the water. He said, when it's really cold and a of snow on the ground, he said, the fisherman, all he does is drain the water, the cooling system of the engine. It's just, he can just manage to get the, so with a, no coolant in or water in the engine, he can just manage, manage to get the boat in and out of the water. This one you've seen before, it was in for a project vote. Um, this is near Lulworth Cove. And this one as well. Um, Dumbledore, Dumbledore, I'm always getting the names mixed up. I'm always saying the, happy, the Harry Potter version by mistake. Another time up in, was it up in Norfolk? We're looking around a big estate and um, they had a church, their own church and a farm. And I think the farm sort of merged into the churchyard because um, caught the sheep asleep at the in front of the church door. And back at Forley uh, Court, MacAlpine's place, um, this um, lady used to bring camels, three or four camels along each year. And it just, just looked an unusual photograph to see if somebody using a camel as a backrest. I'm not, um, well, I don't normally photograph flowers, but uh, this, is, this was in a project boat last year, and I used the kit lens on this. 18 to 55 kit lens. And um, I found that by chance of the kit lens, if you uh, set it at about 50 to 55 mil, I can get within about six inches, six inches of the subject. This is, um, this is taken at the Royal Bath and West show um, about five years ago in the flower tent. Just a few shots. And also um, a garden shed uh, display at the show as well. I'm not into horticulture, but um, it looked quite nice. This was Salisbury Cathedral. I do go down to Salisbury occasionally. I haven't been down there last year because of COVID. Um, friends of mine live down that way and they, they're what they call friends of the cathedral. You can join, you know, pay a subscription every year. And uh, I was in there one day and um, took this photograph and I was lucky really. It was handheld, at sixth of a second, 1600, 1600 ASA. And F, I think it was F3.5, managed to get, and it came out like this. And the de so much detail in the, te and the texture in the picture that um, it seems to hide the grain a little bit. This one was Chester. Um, there's a, a pedestrian bridge that crosses the main street and uh, took a few pictures here on holiday. And I uh, rather like this one. It reminds it looks a bit like a Lowry, Remind, it reminds me of a Lari painting with the like matchstick people in it, but um, it's quite good. And this one was um, Gold Hill at uh, Oh Crikey, Oh Shaf Shaftesbury, um, the scene of the famous Hovis advert. Um, 
I think that's more or less a scene that uh, they used for the advert. At the top of the hill, there's a cafe. And um, the old, not the main entrance to the cafe, but there's another old door they leave open on good in good weather. And you can see this view looking through. And we sat right by the door and there's a painting on the wall exactly like this. And I tried to copy it. It took about 10 shots to try and get the right angles and that. And came up with this and uh, claimed out somebody's uh, 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 washing line at the top of the right hand corner on top of the wall and um, got this picture. Anyway, that's my last photograph and thank you very much. Oh, thank you then. Um, okay. Yeah, you stop sharing. I'll stop share, right. Cheers, Alan. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Alan. That was very okay. interesting and his, with the history to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to vary it a bit because I know, you know, I've got a, 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 an audience that likes all sorts of different things. So when I've done a, um, a slideshow at the Ship Society, it's been people have been interested in ships, basically. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, oh, Angie, and, Angie and um, uh, Darren for clapping. Thank you. I can't hear you, but Alan. thanks so much. Well done, Alan. Thank you. Thank well you. Done, Alan. Uh, have you got any questions to ask, Alan, before we move on? Okay. If I can answer them, you will. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then. All right. Well, we'll um, thank you very much, Alan. It's very nice. Um, Pat, uh, if we want to move on to you now. Yep. <laughs> I can't remember what I've got to do now. Well, um, Can we see that? Yeah, that's it. Right. What I, why I did this, some of it is Paul's fault. I'll just let him know that. Um, at a couple of our meetings, he showed us photographs of what he tried to do and how it ended up. And he wasn't always happy with it. So I thought to myself, I'm fairly new here. And lots of things have happened in the past few years. So now my direction is going to be into photography. So it ended up that, especially with Phil had cancer, which was not a good time. We don't have in this house birthdays and Christmases and that. We make memories instead. Because of having the cancer, you're back and forth to hospital, you just don't come away from that. So we have we make memories, and the only way to make memories is you need to take photographs. But I started off buying a bridge camera. So what I've done is quite a few of these images are from the bridge camera, but all I've done is crop. I didn't know a single thing about editing or anything. So I decided to just put together a few of the images that I've done. So it's my diary of what I've learned on the way through, if that makes sense. Right, so I had written on there where all these were and the date when I actually took them, but this was the start of when I first started using the bridge camera. I'm not that happy on that one piece of uh, the white, against the white, but it's a start. I, this is my sister's dog. I was mucking about with, uh, obviously, the camera again. I'm quite pleased with that one, actually. It's my sister's peacock. So if you've got the peacock, you've got to have the rest of the family. That's just a fun shot, but it came out all right. On doing, when I first bought this camera as well, then I actually did an online oh. photographic course. Um, this is freebie, uh, goes on for a year. The lady in question sends you an email every week and gives you some challenges. So some of these are all from the challenge that we had for that particular month. This actually was in my garden. That 
little flower is about the size of my thumb now. Oh, I was trying to do some of these and that one I'm not so happy with because it was part of the challenge, but it didn't come out as clear as I wanted it to. Getting a bit better. I think you've seen that one before, but it is a little bit better, but still not perfect. But as I say, there's no editing, no nothing on any of these. That one's not so quite so brilliant. But then that one, I was quite pleased with. A lot of these are all just out in the garden. That again, still on the same course. With that one, we was asked to do something different and that was uh, one of the leaves off my rhododendron, but it's not as clear as what it should be, but Trial and error. Right, when we get visit my sisters, then we often pop out to here. My sister lives in Lincolnshire. We often pop out to here. This is off the North Sea, but it's between two air bases, an American air base and a British air base. And this part of the land is their shooting range. But when these seals come in to have their pups, then the aircraft fly across, stop using the range and just keep their eye on this. Now this pup was a day old, but this is, the look of this, this is how near you can actually get to them when they come in. It's a lovely place. I quite like that shot as well. And that one. When we visit my sisters, we quite often pop out to there. But just for your information, the when they have the seals, then they feed them for 18 days and then they're left to their own resources and have to make their way back out to the North Sea and they're on their own. That is it. That was just being in the right place at the right time at um, Wisley one day. And still, no editing, no nothing, just a little bit of cropping. But I can begin to see some of the changes. This was my first photograph of something that was moving. Yeah, if I'd done, some, done it properly, then I should have straightened it, but never mind. Just some different flowers and that. This rain and marshes, when you turn on the telly to ITV at times, you can see people with binoculars and in the background, you can see a big motorway or a big bridge. Well, that is in front of it, rain and marshes, and that's where this is. And you can see there's loads and loads of different plants and that there. And I'm still on just cropping, nothing else. If anybody gets up to there, that place is worth a visit. It is massive, especially if you're into anything military. Now back to this leaf, still on my uh, bridge camera. Now, by now, I had actually bought my Canon 200. But I started to go out with both cameras because what I learned with the bridge camera, <laughs> my brain wouldn't always make it go on to the 200. So I quite often went back to using the bridge camera still. I found the changeover quite difficult at times. That's when you ended up with me as a member to try and sort me out. Again, I ended up using the bridge camera on uh, this shot, even though I did have the other one. This is at the back of Osborne House. 
the model and how she can walk right the way down to each side. Yeah, some of these are in uh, Osborne House now, but I still reverted back to the uh, bridge camera. For some reason, I just couldn't, my brain just wouldn't go into actually using the same controls on the 200. I had to take this, he'd just been born. Mm -hmm. Right, and now I did start to use the other camera now, the 200 now. This was uh, one of the first times out. I left the other camera, the uh, this camera at home and forced myself to use the new camera. But still no editing, only cropping. Some of these with the sharpness and that, then I'm quite happy with. I think that one could do with uh, a bit of work, not a lot, but a bit of work in editing, but no, still doing no editing whatsoever. That bee should have uh, stayed still for a little bit longer, but hey ho. Sometimes simple things are best. I know we're coming up to changing over properly to my other camera and editing in a minute. As I say, most of these are all done while I was still on that course. All right, this is the one of the first ones that I actually edited. So one of my sister's other dogs. That was a brilliant sunny day in Wisby. Park, which was obviously got a big lake, and you can see where the sun, and I've turned it down a bit where the sun was on the uh, water because we're just coming from swimming. I had to put this in because this photo always makes me laugh. As I was taking it, he was standing there saying to me, I hope you're not taking a photograph of me because that will cost you. And I returned that comment with, if it does come out, then I hope you haven't broke my lens. All of these now got a little bit of editing. Now this was in Norfolk last year. We managed to get up there for a couple of days in between COVID virus. We was actually on the boat ready to go out to sea. Um, and we were all just sitting there while this boat was next to us. But this is what we got on the boat to go out to sea. Mm. And I actually managed to take this and a couple of others standing up in a boat while it's rising up and down with the, the tide. Mm. Well, I, I didn't know what that flower was, that's why I took it, but it's nice and clear and gave me something to actually work on, on editing to black out all the uh, back of it. Just my playing around with a little bit of editing now. You see, I do like nature. Well, that was in my back garden. And that was just a couple of weeks ago when I walked up to inhibit. I'm lucky to actually see that. And that is just the end. That is the end of my photo. Yeah, I'm, I'm nice one, Pat. Thank you. Well done, Pat. Uh, have you earned here? Yeah? yeah. Right. Okay, well, thanks very much, Pat. That was very nice. Uh, um, very interesting. And commendable to share your photographs without being edited. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's been very, very blatant. So um, unfortunately, no. Has anybody got any questions? Just that. Nobody. Are you shooting in raw, Pat? Yes, yes. I, am. I am. When did you make the change? Uh, halfway through on the bridge camera. Right. And what right. what would you what would you say has been the main benefit for you? Coming to join the club, I've learned even more. Oh, from the benefit oh, I, from going from Jacob. to Raw. Yeah. Now, now I've actually got a an editing program. I'm not very far into it, but it's better on doing some adjustments on there in Raw. Yeah, I'll Is there any, in Raw. any particular adjustment that you find easier with Raw than JPEG? Things like white white balance, for example. Um, I've only got affinity. The Sorry? Affinity. I've got affinity editing program. Yeah, yeah. And I must admit, I'm not very far into it, but there's more open to me on there on raw than there is if I do it on JP. Yeah. Quick question, there's still, guys. There's still quite a few people in the club who shoot JPEG and um until they've shot in RAW and experienced, as you have, the benefits, then they'll never know what they're missing, really. No. No, no I always do it. Well, the thing is, um, I've got to do a bit more editing. I have to. But going back over the years, for the last 25 years, even though Phil's disabled, then we are both license government registered licensed angling coaches which means we travel up and down the country teaching people how to fish and while we're out there usually someone says anyone got a camera <laughs> and they want to see and then the next time we're at that venue then they like to see their photographs up on the front and they come into the marquee and it's oh look there's me i've done that last year i told you i've done that blah 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 so yeah i've taken photographs but they're I call them policy snaps. Yeah. But that's pushed me more to come and do that bit more now. Yeah, do a bit more editing, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, not you know, just editing, but taking more photographs because yeah. I get the opportunity to go to places that some people never go to. Well, G that's right. G general question, guys. I shoot in RAW and JPEG setting on my camera. So I take both. Yeah. But what I'm yeah. finding is, is obviously it's using a lot of space up on the memory card and uh, a lot of battery. Yeah. Is there any, any advantage in doing both? Well, no. I don't think so. I think it takes up too much space, really. Um, it's only if you were out on, um, say you were in a special place that you never go back again, then do raw and JPEG. Because if your rod doesn't work out, at least the JPEG, you've got a record of it reasonable. Yeah. Why, you know, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I, why would I um, shoot in JPEG? What could go wrong in RAW that couldn't in JPEG? Well, it depends if you're setting your, whatever you're setting your ISO, your shutter speed, you know, your. Yeah, it'll still be wrong in JPEG. So, mm. yeah, it's just wrong in JPEG if you get the settings in the camera wrong. Yeah. But and when you I, look at the picture on the back of the camera, that's the JPEG you're looking at anyway, not a raw file. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, I just as well ditch JPEG because I can do everything, yeah. even basic editing in raw. Yeah. 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 And also, you can change the white balance in raw and you can't do it in JPEG. Mm. You can do more the editing. Other thing, more. The other thing to think about is how are you editing your images? What e what editing software are you using? Pat mentioned she uses Affinity, which is very good. I, I, got, I got Photoshop, Paul, and I've just passed go on it. Right. <laughs> oh, you've turned it on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I that's fine. If you've got Photoshop, um, 
I think it's less of a reason to shoot in JPEG, really, because if you've got the raw file, you've got all the data that was collected at the time the photograph was taken. And the way I think about JPEGs and raw is the JPEG is the camera's version of that raw data edited. The camera has edited the raw data and produced a picture for you. And that's an, an automatic thing that happens. But if you've got the raw data, then you can make your own cake, you know, with the ingredients instead of eating the cake that's been given to you, if you get that analogy. So I look at it. Would it pay to carry on shooting in both until I get my head around? Yeah, more? Well, no. I've got to say that when I switched from JPEG to War, I shot, it, shot in both for a while. And one of the things I used to do was look at the JPEG and then go into the raw image, edit the image as I wanted it, as I thought I wanted it, and then compare it with the JPEG that the camera produced. There were very, very, very few occasions when the camera produced what I thought was a better photo than the edited raw, if you follow me. I yeah, think there's yeah. less... I think it's a bit of confidence. It's a confidence thing that you have to have to start shooting in RAW. And you, you probably do need, in fairness, to build up a workflow. In other words, your editing um, schedule and how you edit images to get to the result you want. And that really comes down to Photoshop and perhaps you know the club's gonna be doing some editing courses and they're great fun. Um, we've done them in the past on um, Photoshop Elements, which is, you know, I only use Elements. I don't use full-blown Photoshop. Um, but um, I've got um, a few other bits I use as well. But that's the way I think. Is I, to... I, I personally think that's the, the, the benefit of the club. And obviously having these workshops, which I think... I certainly miss because you can go on YouTube and you can look, but there's nothing better than actually having someone looking over your shoulder saying this, that's the button you've now got to press to make yeah. that happen. Okay. Um, that's so, that's you know, awesome. roll on when we can all get back together again. Yeah. Well, on YouTube, have a look what to do, write yourself notes, get back onto the program, start to do it. And then, my notes don't make sense, and then I've completely lost it, and I've closed it all down and walk away before I was out the window. I've, I've <laughs> even tried, Pat. I've got a, I've got my iPad next to my laptop, and I've tried having my laptop going and trying to watch it on YouTube at the same time, and oh, I still lose myself. Oh. No. It's just a matter of getting into it. Yeah. I mean, I, when I've done these um, these few images just to show tonight then yeah obviously it's just my progress which i can see some progress but i actually found on affinity how i could write on there so i thought oh i'll do that that at least it remind me where i was yeah i've only just found that last week yeah. you know that course you did you said pat was that sorry? the year with my camera sorry that course you said you did was that yeah. the year with my camera yeah yeah yes it's she's very good easy. Yeah, it's very good. I've I've been out with her a few times as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, I it, it's um, and I think um, when we had our courses, uh, Ray, uh, on the day we had uh, mentors going around and helping you on your laptop. So to you know to follow it, if you weren't following it, then you always had the help on the day to do it. Yeah. But, once you've done that, you remember it a bit more. I mean, Ray, Ray's done some great online tuition over the course of the lockdown. Yeah. Um, and it's been really good. Mm. And that sort of whetted me appetite more than actually um, getting me doing it. <laughs> I, yeah. I want use it because I can see what can library. be done. No, we, we hope to, um, when we all get back to normal, that we yeah. get these courses going, you know, actually personal eyes on the day but yeah. until then you know you have to wait and think yeah i've noticed angela and darren must have got dressed now because they've got video on all right <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah. Ray, I have to say, I am loving your Facebook posts every day. Oh, thank you. Mm. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to get a decent shot of the red kites that are nesting. <laughs> All I'm getting is the towel of the, of the nesting bird at the moment. Bless you. And then the, the, the male is obviously too high up and I just, just can't get him right in the right light. Bless. Mm -hmm. But I will persevere. Wendy, it's good to see you again. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say that we got to well, well, well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was nice to see you tonight. I, I hear mention of red kites, so my ears suddenly pricked up. I love taking pictures of the red kites flying over. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've got a red kite nest um, about 100 metres away from me. Oh, amazing. And um, that they're, they're roosting on there. Oh. picture sit and be patient you'll get there <laughs> yeah, i even went out with the big lens i've got and i just couldn't get anything oh even you will though. is the nest in the tree uh, right? yeah yeah it's it's perhaps about i don't know 30 meters up right but you know all you're getting is perhaps the the, the bird's tail yeah um you can't get the head and then the other day I went out without the camera, walking the dog, and there was <laughs> Zoom the male sitting perfectly in perfect light, and I never had a camera with me. <laughs> it's, it's sort of sod's law, isn't it? Take it with you. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's I am playing with it more. Yeah. Pete, I see you like more Photoshop. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined just to use the Apple software that's on the on the laptop. To be honest, I can do a bit of highlighting and contrast and yeah. cropping. Yeah. Have you got Have you got Lightroom with the Photoshop? Did you get the whole package? Or yes, but I, I'm I'm struggling on Lightroom. Really, I can't um, never do Apple. Photoshop. I can't I can't get from my photos into Lightroom. And if I down, I can download all of my photos and that eats away all of the allowance, the 20 gigabyte or whatever you've got allowance, and then you can't put any more on. That's into the cloud, isn't it, Ray? I, I don't right, know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't oh, yeah. yeah. Go, go to the old right. fashioned Lightroom Classic. Yeah, I've got Lightroom Classic as well. Yeah, that's the one you should use. It's much yeah. easier. Yeah. But um, Photoshop, I can download one photo and then go in and try editing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I'm struggling, once I've edited it, to actually save it. You know, you've got the tick box over in the corner. Yeah, and I tick it save. And that's saved. But that then I've got the mask still appearing. And, and no, I never asked you where you want to send it to, and you can send it back to, I don't know, whatever you call your photo album. Yeah, I've and got you booked happen. in, Chris. I've got you booked in for a bacon roll when lockdown's over and you can come inside. Oh, lovely. I'll do anything for a bacon roll. I've heard that. when in Photoshop, not Lightroom, but in Photoshop, once you go, you take your raw file in and then you open up uh, the other one into like the JK and then you do a little bit of editing then too if you want to. And then to save it, it's quite easily. You go up onto file. Yeah, onto file, file save this, yeah. And come down, save. And yeah, that, that Photoshop the doesn't test. give you that option. It's slightly different to elements. This is sorted. This is Photoshop, Chris. What, full yeah. Photoshop? Yeah, full blown Photoshop, which I have. Right? Yeah, I, I'm tripping over the mask, guys, and, and the, the controls a little bit. You click on them to work and then you go in and then I can't stop them working. You know, I sort of go back to it and click on it again to say, that's it, I've had enough of you. Oh, but for some reason, they just it just creates another mask. I'm, I'm obviously falling over myself <coughs> somewhere along the lines. Yeah. And I, I just need, need a master that, class somewhere. Yeah, I just need that point in the right direction. Yeah. I reckon, Ray, that you won't be the only one that needs some, some more... Um, uh, Oh, tuition. Tuition, I definitely do. I know that my Lightroom can do far more than what I use it for. Yeah. Lightroom absolutely will do everything I want it to do, except it frustrates the hell out of me because it will not do it in a way that I think it should. 
Yeah. And it won't, it won't you listen. Don't to worry about that, Angela. Shut down and listen. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the master of your subject, though, Angela, aren't you? No, no, apparently not. <laughs> oh, I, I think your your photos um, are really good in the format said, you do them. Look, during lockdown, I had some tuition from a guy in Devon, um, really, really nice guy. And I sent him, you know, those images that I posted on Facebook the other day, I sent them to him and said, I got out and used my camera and this is what I took. And he, do, he sent back, he went, nice try. <laughs> oh, nice try. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I, I thought one of them was particularly, particularly good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they're good pictures. Yeah. 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 Uh, he's not that nice, Angel, is he? Um, oh, no. You know, oh, un unfortunately, um, Sue Lloyd was supposed to be mm -hmm. the next one to um, participate, but um, the, um, she phoned me up at seven o'clock and we just had a problem with her computer. You can't get into the computer at all. Um, so we, although we see her here on there, she, it looks as she can't join us. So unfortunately, that's um, that's another um, one gone at the moment. So the only thing I have a, a little, I have a little shop program just to um, show, and then um, that will close the program then. Unless you want any more discussion at the moment. I've got the tits back in my box. They're nesting. <laughs> that's more information than we need, Peter. <laughs> sorry, sorry? So that's more information than we need. They're very nice blue tits. <laughs> oh. I'm wondering whether they go red in the heat. Chris, it's a good job you wasn't on at the beginning when we was on because he was getting the dot food. <laughs> No, they're, they're, they're nesting definitely. We're definitely going to get a pair again. Yeah. So, remember, um, remember the glass out of the window. Right really. <laughs> That's the summer gone. <laughs> take, the, take the glass out of the window. <laughs> okay. Very um, funny. There was nothing wrong with my kite the other day. No, nice no. kite. Well, it was a good shot. Right. It was your you Good effort. Off. It's a string on it. And, and I don't there. edit, so there you go. You should have. <laughs> <laughs> That's what made that other picture fuzzy. <laughs> I, I overheard it. Did you go in too, too close to it? Is that Did it expand the pixels too much? Yeah, probably. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> that's that's why it's in. You lose pixels, so it makes it blurry. It do a bit. It do if you go too far in. Yes. Don't want to go too far in. No. I, I'll try. I'm trying to make it look like one of Angie's without Sorry. the equipment. <laughs> do you do you lose any pixels when you crop, guys? Bringing it back to a serious question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if you crop, you lose pixels. You can do it. Well, if you're going too far, yeah, you're going it expands it. You zoom in too far, it right? oh. pixels, but it makes pixels bigger. Yeah. So. yeah so, so if you've got a wide scene, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of one in particular. I put um, put a, show, a photo of my dog on, on uh, Facebook. Now, that was you a did, wide yeah. scene, and I cropped right... Uh, everything out apart from the dog. Yeah. All right. So did I lose definition and pixels in doing that? Depends no. what it was taken not, with. Not unless you zoomed in. No, I, I just basically cropped all the sides and the top in oh. to leave the dog. Oh, no. Yeah, well, if, if you actually look, when you crop in, it'll tell you the difference in the size of the picture. Right. Right, I get very confused by it, so please don't worry too much. I basically look at it and go, does it look blurry or not? Yeah, and if you put it <laughs> on it. Facebook, it doesn't really matter because it won't look blurry yeah. on there. But no, you've the got... Dog, the, other the, other thing you really. the other thing you just need to remember is if you are taking an image on a bigger image, sometimes that smaller section might look like it's in focus, but as soon as you start cropping in, it yeah. makes that bigger and it will show up any any imperfections that might be there. Mm. 
I'm not saying that was that with that picture at all, but when sometimes for me, if I've if I've made that bit bigger, it shows me that it's not actually as clear as I thought it was. You've focused on somewhere else in the picture. Yeah, that's more likely than not. Or my contact lenses have been in the wrong eye, but you know, that's another story. <laughs> Yeah, in, uh, on the back of the camera, if you um, press in your OK button, it should bring it in a 100% magnification. And so therefore, when you take the shot and you see it on the back, well, in the in the Nikon, that does that. You press the OK button and it zooms in 100%. So you can tell if it's blurred or not. So therefore, you know if it's blurred, take a lot of pictures. I yeah. don't use well, any buttons. No. Well, this, this dog runs 100 miles an hour at the moment. <laughs> it's growing now, isn't it? It's definitely growing. My stalker, Chris, haven't said anything about it yet. No, he was all right. I see him the other day. <laughs> today, or today was he? Running with yeah. his tongue out. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting till you've got him fully trained. <laughs> You're going to use him as a gun dog, Grail. Right? He's had some gun dog training, yes. He can do a 150 yard memory retrieve. So, um, and he works at the whistle. Um, but at the moment, he's a teenager. Yes. Um, yeah. And he won't do anything unless there's something in it for him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he's, he's coming along. I got a grandson like that. <laughs> well, it's a teenager, that's what I'm saying. It's, <laughs> it's a bloody it's, nightmare. It's, 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 <laughs> okay. Well, do, um, I will um, try my little short program because it is short. It was only the fill-in one. Yeah. Well, um, if I do that now and... Uh, and uh, then we can um, have a little chat at the end there if you've got one. Okay? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Right. No, it's been there. All right, go on. Hey! hey. hey. We're there, we're there. Okay, we're there. Yeah. Ah, it's a, the technology trap. Right, anyway, here we go. So you got the one, the first picture up now? Yeah. Right. Okay, so... um. A few years ago, I went to the British Wildlife Centre in Surrey, and uh, I had to. Uh, uh, I did a course with a professional photographer, you know, package course. Uh, there was about fifteen of us there that day, and so um, you meet there, and then uh, he gives you a briefing on what we're going to be doing, and that's what lenses we've got, etc. Uh, so. Um, and everybody tells them what you got. Mm. So I had um, the 7200, I had my 18270, and I had uh, an 8400 or 500, I think it was. And um, so we started off, and he said, We'll go around the animals and um, we'll get inside. So uh, with these. Um, uh, the squirrels, you walk up to a platform which is high up into the tree, and then uh, the staff or the keeper uh, intends the squirrels up and they feed them, you know, with nuts, and then you can take the picture. So you're not too far away in them, and some are in the tree right next to you because the platform is right up in the canopy of the tree. So that way it's so easy to put you up on in there. So you can see the trees is quite near you and you lean to it. And then what he says is, now watch the background. And if the background is noisy, then come down with your, um, down to uh, 5.6 or 6.3, and then that'll blow the background out. And what he, he said, normally, your eyes will set the eyes to about 400. And uh, so he says, then that's our starting point. And as we go around, we may alter that as the day goes on. So this one came along. You can see that part of the 
the canopy banister there, which is next to the trees, and they come along and crawl along there, and you can shoot. This one I've cropped, it was a little bit further away, and the last picture was cropped too. So by cropping in, you um, emphasize your, your picture. We're talking about cropping there. Uh, that is one of the, the best things you can do is to crop it and um, take off the rest of the picture you don't want. Um, this one here uh, was, um, that was an ISO um, 1600 on this one, actually. <laughs> Uh, 320 and S6, S13, and um, it blacks, uh, blocks the whole background out. Uh, so you can see the, the little squirrel close up. This one, uh, the fox, you actually go into the compound itself. So we are all our backs are up against the fence here, and the squirrel is probably about 15, 20 feet away. And he wanders round his little compound and looking over, turning round and walking here, walking there. And you've got the chance then just to keep on photographing that. But that is the, the difference. <clears throat> if you went there just yourself, you wouldn't get inside that compound. You would be photographing through the wire fence, which is, um, you know, not so good. Is it? Uh, he's got, he had a lovely coat, he's well looked after, and he, he's still there, I think, today. But one of them, uh, one of the older foxes had died, and he had left alone now. So whether they've got another one in, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, this is him coming towards you, you see you're kneeling down, and he comes quite close to you, he comes in within about two feet of you. So you can photograph him coming towards you, or going away or running about. Uh, so this one uh, came right down the path. And then just another one as he went back up again and roamed around. Then he had a little yawn and you can see his nice, his nice teeth there like in his tongue. So he had a little scratch. This is then um, you get it into the otter and the otter's in a big pond there, and there's a little island in the middle that they go back and forward to. And so we were on the edge looking at that over there. And then um, it's quite muddy and slippery here, so you've got to be watching you don't slide your camera. And then um, one of the, the keepers with us too, and the professional photographers in with us too. Uh, and um, he and time to come over from the, from the, or out of the water towards you. And this was one coming, swimming over to see us. And obviously, you know, the food is the attraction. And um, this one, you've got to be ready because you never know what they're going to do. And all of a sudden, this one just um, stood up and uh, and you've got to be quick for your camera and keep it up of your eye and one eye on what's going on and then snap it when he comes. But mostly you've got the distance focused in now of where they're going to go. It's coming out of the water here up towards um, the keeper because he sees the fruit and so therefore he's heading up to them and we are all round about behind the keeper there waiting on coming up. And then all of a sudden he'll, he'll just stand up. And so therefore, you know, you've got to be ready. And if you're not ready, you miss the shot. This one, he came out of the water and was dried off a bit. So he got, you can see more of his um, fur now. It's dried off and uh, we've got him there just coming in, been in the water and dried off and walked about the, the area and then came into front of us and we got the picture. What camera settings are you using, Stu? That's the 7200 there. I'm using on that. And the camera is 7100. Nikon. 
Um, the wild cats are the same. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Um, are you an autofocus? They're incredibly sharp. Are you an autofocus? Yeah, it's well to um, no. Well, I, I do. I was focusing on, on that because, um, but I think I had the autofocus there on that day. It was, it's four years ago now. So okay. I'll never forget what really happened on the day. But um, um, this is also a crop tin. We've taken a little bit further away. And uh, then I just cropped in and on. But because um, the 7200 really is a good lens, and so therefore you can keep on zooming in and you don't lose any of your uh, contour of the picture. And, uh, and then all of a sudden he uh, had a little scream about, like, and um, he started to move down a little bit. And uh, Keeper went over and shoots them back up again, like. So he went back up. But uh, you, you know, these are the things you've just got to be ready with the camera. You never know when they're going to do anything. And so you've got to keep up with your eye. And as you move around, sometimes it just sits there and does nothing. So you do a few pictures and then you wait to see what else is going to happen. Uh, so there was two of them male and female, and one was further up than the other. Um, now this is talk about, we were talking about cropping here. Um, this one is, um, she brings, um, the keeper brings the oil out, and then she puts it on the tree there, and sits it there, and then um, sometimes you'll sit there, or you'll move down a little bit further, down onto another bit of tree, and then, and then you all go round, you're all round about photographing and, and while he's sitting there. And as I say, you can see here now, there's a little stem right above his head. And that's the things when you take it, you sometimes don't see that. And so you have to move round, you know, if you want to avoid that. Bit. So always keep moving round to see where you're going, uh, what's behind it, so that it doesn't come from his head. So I cropped this one and I removed the stem above his head now. So you can see what the difference makes now of your picture when you, you crop in. And they, they had the tiny oil there, uh, oil there, please, out there. And um, she sits them on, you know, one of that. And then there are, I think we had them in the buttercups and daisies and things like that. Uh, but that was, uh, put them on uh, this um, part of the fence here. And you just sat there while you go around and photograph them. Um, we moved on a bit then and she went and got one of the hedgehogs out. And uh, she brought that one for the grass and you, you have to get right down on your belly here now. So be prepared to get mucked up on the day, you don't go with nice new clothes like, you know, go with some old jeans and a top that you're going to get, if you get down on the grass, you're not going to get worried about getting mucked up. So this was quite dry here. It was the autos that was the worst one of the lot because it was really slippy and muddy. And she, um, he moved around the grass, everybody was photographing, and then, um, she took them up and she put them on a kind of little stone area and uh, you could move round there. Everybody can move round and uh, shot, shoot the pictures. We got one of the, the badger and the badger's a very uh, awkward animal to photograph his face because he's always in the ground, looking in the ground. And when he's moving round, and that was a bit the best one I got of him looking up that day. And he's coming towards me like that. But uh and he's in um like a pit. You've got a high wall, you know, so they can't get out and you're photographing down in there. But if you um if he's coming towards you, then that's the best thing to catch him before he comes right up against the wall. 
Um, this one uh, we changed to, we said, um, get your um, 400 lens out if you've got one, or 500 lens. And we were just uh, in um, a clear area, and she went and brought the, the little mouth, uh, field mouth, mouth out. And, you know, he's very tiny. He's so tiny. And it's in a pot there. And she'll just lay it down on, on the ground. And then we all go around taking shots of it on the day, you know. So he, and the, he got, he was all right. He was sitting there for a little while. And then all of a sudden he, he wanted to go down the stem. And he ran down the stem into the pot and jumped out the pot. And he came round under, I was kneeling down at the time. And he ran under my leg. Uh, but we managed to get a few pictures and then she put them back up and he did it again, ran down. And then in the third time she said, oh, he's getting too stressed out. So uh, she took him away because um, that was what he was doing. He was just running down the straight stem into the park and disappeared, trying to get away. Um, they got a couple of pearl cats there. They got, well, there was one there and another one colored over, but this one is the one I got. And that's down in a pit, so there's no fence round about you. You just lean over and photograph them in the pit flag. And then um, there's another little, he, he went through that little tunnel bit there, and then he comes up and he climbs over. So he's on the move most of the time. But the, the keeper does go in and punch in hands up near, you know, the place that looks uh, good for photography shots. Uh, went on a, a shoot for the Kingfisher up in Droughtwich, and um, Chris has been there. And this is all kind of, this branch is set up, and there's a long tank from the high that goes away from you, and the branch is at the end of the tank. And um, you get your camera set up. When you're in the high, there's one eye more or less like shoulder level, you know, for a photograph. And then there's one down the bottom, and it has a little tripod stand that you can put the camera in there and photograph along the tank. So when he's up on the branch, this is the idea. It's a little tank within a tank, although it's just water. But the fish is in there, and this guy, when he goes up there, he puts the fish in. And then you... Um, you get set up with your camera, and what you do is when you get in the high, on on the top level, this is the top level we were shooting on. Uh, I was with my stepdaughter, so she had um, full frame uh, with a 500 lens on it. So we used this here and we changed the tabs in and out the camera because we, we focus on the branch and then it's a waiting game. Because he's not there, you have to wait till he flies in when he sees, sees the fish in the tank. So it is just like a streak of lightning. You can't, you know, you haven't got time to try and focus him when he comes in. So you focus on the branch, get the camera set, and then that's it. When he comes in, you just bang off the pictures. So he's up there, he dives down into the tank, and he gets the fish. Uh, he holds it in his little beak there for a little while, and then he starts flinging it around all over the place to kill the fish. And um, as you can see here, he's walking it around. You can see that it's very difficult because this is, you know, photographing here, and the fish is going. He's really tossing that fish around quite quickly. But. And then he gets it in his beak and holds it up and he pushes it round about and then it's tossing it up and down and then all of a sudden he just says then it's time to eat the fish and down he goes. You can see the little marks of a rain that was starting to rain that day. So that's him, he's had his lunch and he's sitting there and I'm full up now. So that's it.
Okay. So as I said, it was a short program because I thought two is going to have a longer program with uh, Iceland pictures. So I'm yeah, well. yeah, very good. Yeah. Stuart, yeah. the first couple of pictures of the otters in the water. Yeah. Did you ever try to convert them to black and white? I have, yes, I have got a black I and white. I thought they would be really good in black and white. Yeah, They're really good anyway, but... Yeah, yeah he is. He's quite good in black and white. Too. Yeah. I've done that, and I've done a few other ones that's uh, in black and white. But um, I think all the, the otters are the best ones for the black and white. Mm, that's what I thought, with the water and... Yeah, in yeah, the water, right. and the dusty, muggy water. But then... Sometimes with the black and white, you can't see the colour. Yeah. You know. Well, that's because it's black and white. <laughs> yeah. Well, that might be sound to do with it. Black and white's a clue. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stuart, uh, I knew it meant, sir. Yeah, this would love the black and white. Stuart, when, Stuart, when you crop in, yeah. do you crop in original or free form? That, was you, the, that, one you saw, that one, the first one you saw, was the original picture, isn't it? Yeah, and you crop. Uh, what and, is the... But it's not the raw file. Uh, mm -hmm. I've turned that into a GFA, right? Yeah. Well, I was trying to get, what's the difference between, you know, the original is obviously the original, but if you go freeform, what do you actually lose in the photo quality, if anything? You don't really lose the quality. If it's the raw file, you don't lose quality because it's there all the time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's full of information, the file. So but if you then wanted to print it off in, say, A4 for a club competition yeah. on free form, would it still print off OK on an yeah. A4? Yeah. Well, if, if you crop it square and then print it at A4, it's the printer's going to elongate the photo to fit the page. Yeah. It won't keep yeah, the aspect yeah, ratio. ratio. If one gets that, get it's all doing that. Get get doing that. But, but, Ray, you can zoom in and then crop it. But he's talking about aspect ratio. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, he's talking about aspect ratio. Yeah. yeah. It's a very good question, Ray, yeah. Uh, yeah. about cropping, because <laughs> I personally, purely personally, Always crop to A4, which is 29.7 by 21 centimeters. Right? Can you repeat Always. that, Paul? 29.7 centimeters by 21 centimeters. Yeah, that's A4. Right? And the reason I do that for most of my pictures is I do a lot of photo books. So if you have an A4 photo book and it's a portrait, you get two portraits side by side on an A4 page, and you'll get four landscape portraits, one, two, three, four oh, on a page, or one on a page. And I just find it a whole lot easier to crop to a prescribed aspect ratio. There are some images where it is very difficult to do that. And there is a case um, for doing a square crop in that case. Um, and the square crop is not so good if you're doing a photo book. I do a lot of photo books, a lot. Yeah. yeah. A4 is not a good photo size, Downsize of that, you know. Uh, yeah, oh, the, the, oh, the other oh, thing is, Ray, sorry, if you crop to A4 all your pictures and you want to print for the project boat, it will print perfectly at A4. If you do freeform crop, where the aspect ratio is not 29.7 to 21, then it will not fit an A4. And when you set your printer up to print it on an A4, you have to tick the box that says crop to fit, and you will lose some of the image off one of the sides. Yeah, that, yeah. that's what I was trying okay. to get. Oh, thank you. Yes, I know. I, I know exactly the question you were asking, and it is a dilemma. But the easy answer, I think, is always crop to A4. It's also frustrating if you try and get pictures printed from any because I don't like having to crop to a set size because I think I want to crop for the picture rather than the size. But then what I found 
That's right. I can't get things printed unless I do another alteration to it, and that it, it frustrates me. Something chronic, but yeah. Well, it's it's the pure physics, Angela, isn't yeah. it? Um, if you, if you, if you get it, if you're printing to A4 and you crop to A4, you don't have a problem. If you crop free form and you want it printed to A4, you're going to suffer the frustration. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other the other thing, Ray, uh, where you were asking about the lens, you know, um, that the uh, seventy two hundred two point eight. So you know the lens. When you're photographing these animals, you uh, once you take the picture, you can zoom, zoom, zoom right in, and you don't lose your quality of your picture. Yeah. What was it? A Nikon lens, Stuart? No, that's a Sigma, and the Sigma are very good. Great, great lenses. Yeah, <laughs> great lenses. Very good. I don't, and the other one I've got, my old camera, is the standard one I have is eighteen two seventy. That's a Tamron lens. Tamaron. And yeah, I've, I've got a Tamaron yeah. actually on the camera now. I've got a Tamaron on a Z6. And the, what I did find with this Tamaron lens, when it's a lovely bright day, you can get beautiful pictures. But if you have a dull day and you go into somewhere it's a bit darker, I find that lens is not capable of taking the lesser light pictures coming into the camera even if you open it up to 5.6 or 4.5. Uh, so you uh, have to uh, watch uh, more, you have to be longer on your picture to take it. Another question, forward. another question to the wise. Um, we, you know, you, we mentioned about editing in Photoshop yeah. and you can do all sorts of wonderful things. Yeah. Do, do you still bracket? At the moment I'm bracketing free you know, sort of the three stages of a shot. Would you bother with that? Is there any need for it in photo, if you're using Photoshop? Well, not really, because you've, you've got the facility of Photoshop there, I think, anyway. I don't know, maybe somebody's more experienced about that than me, but in Photoshop, you've got all the tools there. They yeah, but bracketing, bracketing is the idea is you get one for the sky, then one for the background or highlights or whatever. You get three phases. Yeah. It's the, um, I can't think of the bloody word. Well, yeah, you know, HDR. I was going to say, yeah. it, other time you might want to use it if you're going to merge them into a HDR picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah that, that, that was the question that yeah. if you're going to merge them, if you've got yes. sky background and whatever, you merge all three and then you yeah. should get the perfect yeah. Yeah. Right. exposure. exposure. <laughs> a, a HDR function. Yes. Um, the problem I have with that is my computer doesn't like it if I do more than three images and it crashes because it's too much information. But that's another whole other flipping conversation to have. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> just wondered the need for if you're shooting in RAW, if there's a need to do bracketing, really. Well, yeah, because if you but, blow if you blow something out, it doesn't. If you blow the sky out, it doesn't matter whether you do it in raw, yeah. JPEG, anything. You, you've blown it out; it's not there. But there is an answer. <laughs> you can just oh, no, don't don't, like, don't start you him off on sky the replacement. Sky <laughs> replacement. You do it on Photoshop now, can't you? You but can, it's is, not as good as the other one. There is a other. quick get-to, isn't there? Pardon? There is a quick go-to on Photoshop for the sky. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I find if you're shooting through the trees, it does the sky, yeah. but it won't do in between the trees. No, no. You've you can adjust it to do that. <laughs> yeah. You need you to get luminar. There's a bit on the bottom that tells you you can, I um, can't remember what they called it. But you, you can fill in the gaps if you've missed gaps. If you zoom in, you can see it. You move the sliders and you fill the gaps in between the branches. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're getting beyond me again I now, Chris. Can't get away <laughs> to, isn't it? The answer is to take the three shots and then have one yeah. exposed for the sky, one exposed for the 
middle highlights and then one for the foreground and then you put them together and you've got a properly exposed photo. Yeah. As a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, you're better to underexpose in the camera because you're capturing all the data. Because if you overexpose, you blow out the sky and you've got no pixels, even in a raw file, as Chris said, you'll have no pixels to play with. But if you, if you underexpose, you can always bring the lightness and the saturation and the levels. You, you've got something to play with. So you've got to... You, back in the shadows. You should, you should really um, err on the side of underexposing rather than shoot, overexposing. Shoot to the right. Yeah, shoot to the right, yeah. <laughs> Chris, is that the next meeting? Well, what, shoot to the right? Or all the, all the, this that you've been discussing? <laughs> I, I found it very useful guys <laughs> Ray the best thing to do is to get a picture and just see what it does when you start editing it honestly it's the only way because I'm like you I can't read a book and do it or watch a tutorial I have to physically do it and know what the result is I thought you could read Ange I can read a book I can't, I can't I didn't know you couldn't read a book the only, the only thing it was done in Spanish that you can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's been a, quite an interesting evening. Um, it's it's slightly different. different. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been very enjoyable, guys, and thank you for yeah. uh, all those that have uh, shown their pictures, photos. Very, very good. Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you, thank thank you for all your comments. Alan and Stuart. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, well done, Pat, because yeah. she's not she's not a committee member, and she's take, taken it on her to show us her photographs, and um, I think they were, were really good, and I think that she told a story there about where she's gone from A to B in quite a big way, and I think she le deserves a lot of credit for what she's done tonight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> It was your fault in the first place, Paul. Well, I don't remember this. I heard you say that at the beginning, but I, I, I thought you might have got me confused with Paul Walker. No, do you, you remember when you went to Oxford? Yeah. I can't even remember what I had for lunch, but go on. <laughs> you showed us all on one evening all the oh, yes. shots that you took, yes. the ones that you wanted and ones that didn't turn out. Yeah, the outtakes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Was that before your bad knee? <laughs> so what that proves, Pat, is you were the one person listening at that meeting. <laughs> yeah, I don't no, remember to, that. to some extent, it just showed me that a lot of you have done it for a lot more years than what I have. And even you can't get the perfect picture, which gives me more encouragement to just jump in feet first and have a go. And there, is no gets a perfect there, is, there is no definition of a perfect picture because what's perfect to one person is not to another. So That's exactly. true. Yeah. 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 The, other, the other thing is when, you, when we have speakers and they show you sorry, when they show you a, port, a portfolio of fantastic images, you don't see the ones that, that, that went wrong. And for every one they show you, there's 20 that went wrong. No doubt. And none of them will ever bear their soul to you. No, no, exactly. That teacher is listening, Pat. <laughs> Remind you that, that woman that was on the other day, I mean, she showed us a few of her pictures that she didn't like or weren't right, didn't she? Which is one of the few speakers we've had that have ever done that. She was the best one ever. Yeah. I think she was by far. Yeah. yeah I chose so my bad pictures. Well, you put them yeah, in. Yeah, but we're still waiting to see the good ones, Pete. Well, it's in the eye of the older, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, I suppose that's what your wife told you, isn't it? <laughs> she don't tell me nothing. Do you blame her? Because you don't <laughs> listen, <to> maybe. <laughs> what? You know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm deaf, as you know. Right, guys, I'm going to go and see one Master Chef now. Then. 
Yeah, oh, God. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing, Ray. Stop texting us with your puddings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just get so bored. You know, <laughs> catering at the club the barbecue now, then, right? Um, I might be able to do a um, banana bread or um, tea bread is the favourite one at the moment. Oh, tea bread's good. Yeah, I like tea bread. And, Anything, uh, anything's fine. <laughs> Red pudding, I'd make any a cake. Red good. pudding now as well. Thank <laughs> you, chips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, guys, I'll just say good night to everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very, very good, good meeting and thank you, everybody. Cheers, mate. Right. Right. Thank, right. thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hi. Right. Bye. Do it from mute. We can't hear a word you'll say. <laughs>